morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here today. If you would, we're going to start our, the worship part of our service by singing the solid rock. And if you would stand with me, we're going to open to hymn number 215, the solid rock. to know that we have that rock to stand on especially in the world that we're in that right now um let's see we're gonna now turn to hymn number um 111 there isn't gonna be a scripture reading so we're just gonna turn to hymn number 111 and sing how firm a foundation and as we sing the kids are gonna head out to junior church
again, another great song. And uh, now we'd like to have Jay come forward with the sermon. Good morning, everybody. It has been a long time since I've done this, and I feel like it. I don't think I ever really got used to it, but I uh, definitely feel like it's been a long time right now, especially now that I'm standing here looking at everybody. But uh, I've uh, worked quite a bit at preparing this, and uh, I'm going to start by saying there's only a little bit here that I'm going to say in the very beginning that comes from me, and then it is going to be Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. And I don't know how many of them I will get through. If I get through them all, that'd be great. If I don't, I put them all on paper so you can take them home with you and uh, take a look at them throughout the week or whenever you uh, like to do your Bible reading. Um, because the scripture is what's important. Anything that I come up with on my own is just an opinion of mine, and maybe it's biblically based, but it's still an opinion, and we could sit there and argue and debate over it. I prefer to stick with God's word that's not debatable. It's just accept it or don't. And um, there are people who will just not accept things that even God said himself and put in scripture, and that's that's our free will. We're able to do that. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I ask you to help me as I go through these uh, verses and, and uh, that I'd be able to share from your word, Lord, and things that would help people. I ask that this glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to talk about hard, com hard conversations, sin, politics, and religion. I'm going to start out by saying... I don't like this time of year. I'm not talking about summer. I'm talking about summer before an election. But uh, it is something that, as believers, we need to be involved with. And uh, I know at some point in America it became popular to say, I don't talk about politics or religion. You'll hear that at work. You'll hear that in a lot of places. But I think that's a poor idea. I think the beginning of that becoming a common phrase was the end of just good conversation where you could talk to someone and have a differing opinion and it didn't turn into a battle. I think nowadays people will only, they'll do their best to only talk to people who have the same opinion because they feel that's gentlemanlike or whatever you want to call it. And I, I just don't think that was the best. I think, uh, I think it would be a better way of handling things if you could just talk to someone who has a differing opinion talk about it. Maybe you won't change their minds and maybe they won't change yours, but it would be way more civil to just have a conversation except, hey, my buddy Bob here, we, we don't agree on everything, but we're good buddies and we help each other out anyway. I think that would be a nicer way of doing business, but it became popular to say we don't talk about politics or religion at the dinner table or at work or whatever, and I think that took away something from us in America to be able to have a conversation. Um, one of the common things that we hear about is what, what America looks like compared to what it started. America was born because a group of born-again Christians wanted a country with freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. The separation of church and state that people talk about is not in the Constitution. Don't be confused about that. That is what people say who really want to trip you up, or maybe they don't even know. But it is not in the Constitution. It's not in any legal documents. It was in a letter. Um, and our nation was built by Christians and has slowly become unrecognizable as a Christian nation. How did this happen? I'm sure it was under attack from the very beginning. Jesus warned us in John 15, 18. He said, if the world hate you, you know it hated me before it hated you. The moment this started happening as a nation, it was going to be under attack because this, the founding fathers wanted a Christian nation. They wanted a nation where they could have freedom of religion. They were Christian men. If you read about those founding fathers, most of them were young men. And you know what's amazing about them, guys? 
what they were doing as young men, they were either going to be heroes or hung for treason. Those guys gave up, gave up everything. Many of them had family that were carted off and jailed or killed. They were robbed while doing the great work that they did to make this nation. They gave up everything to either become a hero or hung for treason. And we know how that went for them. We have a great nation that is absolutely falling to pieces as it's lost Christianity as a, as a, as a standard. Today, America looks more like Sodom and Gomorrah than, it, than anyone ever thought possible. As I see in current events today, I notice that the things God called an abomination in the scripture are the very things that some people are fighting for. If you find yourself voting for someone who you find akin to Santa Claus, giving out something you may want, at what cost is it? Is it costing you the vote of the person who is actively fighting for one of the abominations that God warns us about in his holy scripture. I don't, I'm not talking about sides here. I'm just telling you, watch for what you are looking for. Be careful about who you support. Sadly, I've heard believers saying that they think the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament and today are different. Did he have different standards, they think? For Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Job, David, Solomon, and so on than he did for Peter, James, John, the other apostles, and then today. Does he have different, different standards today than he did for all these different generations of people? I'm telling you absolutely not. The standards have not changed for what is sin. If you don't like this conversation, it's likely because you've been conditioned to avoid hard and uncomfortable topics, but I promise you, I won't tell you a standard of mine, only those that God gave us in the Bible. We are under attack. Our children are under attack. Our faith is under attack. The enemy has worked for a long time to be at the point where they don't have to hide their attacks anymore. At one time, they had to hide and be subtle. They don't have to hide anymore. The enemy is blatantly attacking us right now. Our children, they are after our children more than anything. A long list of scripture that I have. I'm going to be hitting up as many of those verses as I can. I left room so that you could write a little note. What I did as I was doing it, I just looked at the scripture and I wrote who was being attacked or who was being supported. But I left room for you to write whatever you'd like there. You might just put a circle around it for, hey, I want to look at this later more. But um, any of you that have heard me a lot, you know that I tend to use the scripture as my crutches because that I trust 100%. I don't trust me 100%. My opinions could be tainted. I don't want that. So let's go ahead and start. I almost need an assistant up here with a second Bible to keep turning pages for me because it's going to take me a while to find them all too because I didn't mark them ahead of time like I often do. Um, oh, and these are not in the particular order that I'm going. They're just all the verses. So Psalm 139, let's turn there first. This whole chapter is great. I think I could probably say that about like every chapter in the Bible, but it seems funny how you can read one chapter and be like, man, that was really great. And then the next time you open your Bible, you read a chapter and you're like, wow, that was really great. But anyway, 13 through 16 is where I want to focus, but I would recommend reading this whole chapter when you have time. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's room. Um, that word covered, that was not in the original translation. That was put there by translators to try to help you understand it. They, uh, the word weaved would, would be another word. It's talking about when God, when you were being formed in the womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that thy soul knoweth my, uh, right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the low parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. That's another word that was uh, added for continuity and to be able to understand it. But another word would be unformed. And in thy books all thy members were written which in, which in 
continuance were fashioned as yet there was none of them. This verse, this passage that I just read, I have this here to point out God knew us before we were even completely formed. Jeremiah 1.5. I get a, I love children. And just thinking about the attack on our children, uh, it's hard for me to even talk about sometimes. I just, it's just, it's just a lot to deal with when you think about how wonderful children are and how susceptible they are to whatever they're being taught or whatever uh, you're as an adult so much stronger than them and I just think about how when people hurt them it just hurts me so much to even think about it but it's a fact and we need to face it and do our best to help Jeremiah 1 5 before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations again it sounds very much like God knows us before we are even born. While we are yet forming, God knows us. Exodus 20, verse 13. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Once I say the verse, you'll be familiar with it. Thou shalt not kill. It's one of the commandments. The next one is Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is in his reward. As arrows are in the hand of thy mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, they shall, but they shall speak in the enemies with they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I love that verse. Children are a blessing, even when you feel like you're too old to be raising three and a half year olds because you're 44 and your knees hurt they're still wonderful and the headaches they give you I'm sure they're good too for some I don't know what but I love my boys and they have way more energy than me so uh, I think I speak from experience here children are a blessing even if uh, there's a uh, what 17 years difference I don't, I don't know where Katie was in that but Joey and Katie what's that 21 and seven and 19 year olds and then three and a half year olds so there's a bit of a gap there but and that would be a whole nother message talking about adoption and the, and the great thing that God's done for us but um, I'm sure you get it I love children and I don't want to see them attacked even if it's before they're born because it's still an attack on someone that God already knew before they were completely formed Matthew chapter 18 is next If anyone feels like I am moving too quickly through these, I will not be offended if you just holler out, slow down, or give me a second. I would much rather you say that and then help the next person over because they didn't want to say it. So if you need me to slow down or something, just let me know. Matthew 18, 1 through 11. I'm not going to read that whole 1 through 11. Um, I don't even remember what I wrote on this list over here. Yeah. I put 1 through 11 because if you're going to go and visit that passage, I'd like you to read that whole passage. But uh, it's talking about how Jesus loves the children. And verses 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offenses come. Don't be that stumbling block. Help children. Now, one thing I recommend is if you don't have uh, one of those strong concordances, and maybe there's a better one, I don't know, Pastor Sal might know of a better one. He's been doing this for a long time. Maybe some of you do, but I, I'm a fan of that one. And um, 
one thing I found is when you see a word that you think you know, but you're like, I don't know if that really fits in there the way I would use it. Maybe, just maybe, that word was put there in the 1600s and doesn't make sense with the way we talk today. So look it up and find out where that word came from. And I did that with that word offend. And I wrote it in the side of my Bible so that it wouldn't just be in my notes. But it means to entrap, to trip, entice to sin. It came from the Greek word uh, scandalone. And when I traced back that word, it talked about a bent stick snare. This is literally talking about intentionally causing children to sin, intentionally causing harm. I don't know how to exhaustively say what this means, but I think we get the point. Don't harm children. Be helpful to them. Jesus obviously cared for children very much. There's other parts of Scripture that talks about that. Um, my next verse. Proverbs 22.6. I hope that by giving you that list of scriptures, it gives you a whole arsenal of, of, uh, of verses to use if you're ever in one of these conversations that I'd love to see people get in where you just calmly talk about a situation or uh, something that you can disagree on, but you have the answers, the right answers, that come from scripture. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is a great verse and a great reminder for us as parents or grandparents, uncles, aunts, to train children the right way. Now, I think every one of us in this room also knows about free will. Free will allows us to be horrible sinners. Free will allows us to just deny the power of Scripture in our lives. Free will allows us to ignore God completely. So, this verse is a great verse and a great reminder for us to train children. But understand, your children, they're going to grow up with that free will, and it can be heartbreaking watching your child not do what you've trained them to and not follow the Scripture. But in that instance, you have prayer, and you can just pray forever and hopefully the Lord gets a hold of them. But be, be understanding that sometimes the way the Lord gets a hold of them is pretty rough too. That is a fact and that applies to every one of us. Deuteronomy chapter 6. In these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, now, if we just fast forward a little bit down, you'll see verse 12, the Lord says, then, thou, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it goes down to warn them. Don't forget where these things came from. You're going to have, uh, actually back a little bit, I think 11, in the house full of all goods, which thou fillest not, and the wells digged, which thou didn't dig, vineyards. So it's warning us, all these things that you didn't work for, when you get the land that I'm going to give you, don't forget where it came from. Don't get lazy and wasteful. It reminds me of the great nation that the men from World War II built for us, and then a lot of us didn't really have to work hard for this freedom that we have, and it's being taken for granted right now. Um, we follow the Hebrew model of God gives and then we slowly forget and get selfish and greedy and think we earn something. But uh, if you look through the history of the Jewish nation, they were given great and then they lost it all, carried away, killed, enslaved, 
I don't know, you name it, bad things happen to them. And um, we kind of, uh, we're kind of, we're over 200 some years into our nation, and I don't think we're doing real well right now because we're so anti-scripture as a nation. Proverbs 17, uh, verses, um, verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Just one more verse reminding us of how important children are, how great children are. Whatever relationship you have to them, parents, grandparents, I know it's not saying it here, but nephews, nieces, they're wonderful. Be involved in children's lives. Be the good adult in their life that they can count on. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm intentionally going New and Old Testament for a lot of this stuff. Um, I have no trouble just trusting the New or the Old Testament, but I do know that there are people who feel that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God that we have today or that was in the New Testament. So I do like using New and Old Testament to drive home points to show that the consistency of God was that the standard of sin was the same. There are different uh, punishments you'll see in the New Testament from the Old, but he never changed something from sin to okay. So just keep that in mind. This whole chapter, again, is one of those chapters that should be read together, but I'm really trying to give you a whole pile of scripture to use in these important topics. So I'm going to go with verses 15 and 16. Actually, yeah, 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect through thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is telling us that the scripture can be learned all the way from your youth. So we need to be teaching our children from scripture while they're young. Ingrain it into them so they understand it. Make it something that they have to choose themselves one day to walk away from. Don't let them, don't hope they find it when they're 20 years old and have made a whole lifetime of bad decisions already. It's just important to be able to train them up right from the get-go. And verses that mention this, it's almost like in passing, the way it says, the way I read it, as from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture. It's, it's like barely even mentioning it. And then it talks about how great and important the Scriptures is. It's just like that your child should know the Scriptures. I mean, if you know the Scriptures and you believe in the Scriptures, why wouldn't your children know the Scriptures? And I just think it's, it's interesting. The, the way it was mentioned here, how it is just understood. If you know the scriptures, your children should too. And I think that's important. We need to keep doing that. And I know it's hard. Ephesians 6, uh, 1 through 4. I think I wrote, yep. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it might be well with thee and mayest live long in the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you look at just those few verses, it mentions the whole family. It mentions the father, the mother, the children. That's how families were intended to be. Anything otherwise is an indication that there was hardship and hurt, tragedy, Mothers and fathers are supposed to raise children. This verse has commands for everybody involved. Responsibility for everybody involved. The Bible is laid out. It's a big book. But there really is 
so much instruction for almost everything you face in life, but it does require a lot of effort to find it. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood and against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take up, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. There's more to read there, but I'd like you to do that on your own. This is taking an, this is telling you to take an active, offensive stance against what is being attacked, what, what is attacking, all right? Don't, don't just sit there and be in a defensive mode. When someone brings something up, this scripture has the answers. Use it. You can actively talk to someone who has a difference of opinion. Maybe they won't just say, well, you know, it does say that in the Bible. I guess I was wrong. Maybe that's not the response you'll get. But you are using the only true source of, of what's right. So look at these verses. Mar mark them. Write them down. Memorize them is the best. I can't memorize them all, but we need to be using these. The whole armor of God is important. I know we've, uh, most of you are familiar with the Rotz family. I know Tom and um, Sam and Rodney, we all dealt with them a lot, and that's one of the things that how many times a day did they mention the whole armor of God? I think every day we talked, through, had a devotional on that, right? Like that missionary is in Costa Rica and I don't know, a lot of different countries now. And if that guy has been doing this for, what, 20 years or something like that now, and he's still harping on you need to have the whole armor of God, there's a reason for it. He knows what's out there and what he's fighting against. And we need to be prepared too. The whole armor of God, very important passage. Go ahead and read that more. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom is steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We're not just fighting ideas or positions. There's spiritual warfare going on around us, and they're, and they're fighting actively. And like I said, the world's at a point where it doesn't have to hide that it's attacking the Bible anymore. That's where we're at. They can openly mock us. The Olympic Games, I didn't even think about that before now. The Olympic Games, everyone probably seen something about the, the opening act of that. That was for the whole world to see a mockery of, of uh, our Lord and Savior. They're not hiding it. Romans 8. Thirty-one, Romans 8.31. What shall we say then? What, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not be with him also? Freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to charge of God, to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather than, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also mark, maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tri tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love us, that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
if you know Jesus as your Savior, none of those things can take that from you. You are his. You cannot be lost after coming to that uh, knowledge and salvation. Sinners, Christians are sinners. Christians will sin. Some Christians will get away from the church and do a lot of things that are absolutely terrible. I do not believe that someone can lose their salvation based on this verse. And if you know that person, if you know a person who's deeply struggling and you know that they know right from wrong somewhere inside them, that knowledge exists, try to reach out to them. Try to bring them back. They're worth fighting for. God did so much for us, and we need to be standing up for him. All of these things are things that we can face. Not all of us are facing all of these different uh, struggles and, and tribulations, but I think, I think more and more is going to come. The fight is not against just what we can see, is what I had put in there. Um, Mark chapter 5. Some people will use the word coincidence. You know, something, what a coincidence. Yeah, there, there's some funny things that can be a coincidence, but a major topic, if you ever see a major topic in the world and then you see something in scripture that might touch on that, I don't call that a coincidence. And I don't know any other spots in scripture that says it just like this, but this stands out to me. Mark chapter 5. This is talking about when Jesus had uh, come up uh, on a person who was indwelled by uh, a demon of some sort. I'll start at verse 6. But when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him and cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with Jesus, thou Son of God, the Most High God? I adjure you thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. It scares me, thinking about all these people out there who want to be called they and them. That is not a coincidence. Do not be confused. Not everyone that has they or them written on their little name tag where they work understand the movement they're a part of. Why on earth would someone want to be called a plural? Where did this start? Who first said, I need to be called plural? I need to be called by a multitude, a legion. I understand that people don't even understand what they're involved with at times. Think about children playing with Ouija boards. They don't understand what they're involved with and how dangerous that they're dealing with something. But we can look at scripture and you see this, my name is Legion for we are many. You read on, there was 2,000 demons in that person. Can you imagine that as a parent? Seeing what your child's going through, they don't even know what they've gotten into. This is out there, this is out there fighting for your children, fighting for you. Because we're going to get to it, but they're going to lose this battle. I wish there was more about this subject that I could show you, but I think this is the clearest point in Scripture about that movement right now. Revelation 20.10. And the devil that deceived, deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, 
that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Things are going to happen in the future. I don't know what they all look like, but I do know this. Could, I should have done those verses in the opposite order. But anyway, I think you get the point. God wins this battle. There is never a point where God was afraid of losing the battle. God knows he's going to win. But he created us. And right now we're just living life in a period of time with these two bookends of the start of all this. And God already knows what the end looks like. And he gave us a little glimpse of it. He's going to win. And if you want to be on the winning side, then you have to know scripture. And you have to accept Jesus as your savior. You have to choose to be on the winning side. And that's really all it is. It's a choice, and then you've got to continue to grow in your salvation and grow closer to God, grow, grow by studying Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, verse 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they, will, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. It sounds to me like people get really focused on right now and you know how many of you can say you remember your grandfather really well go ahead raise your hand you remember your grandfather well a grandmother maybe what about great grandfathers anybody remember a great grandfather great grandmother oh boy we're not looking at too many great greats no so that's how far back you have real knowledge of in your head that you can physically understand and we can't know the future the closest thing to know in the future is knowing someone that's pregnant right now and saying they're going to have a baby. That's about the closest thing, I guess, that you could say that you know about the future. So you only know this tiny little span. And it's easy to just get wrapped up in that. And I'm guilty of that too, believe me. But this verse warns us that there's a lot more than just your great-grandfather, your grandfather, your father, yourself your great-grandmother. I remember my great-grandmother. She was a really nice lady. I don't know anyone past her. The time that you're alive, the ancestors that you got to know, and the children that you will know, that is great, but that is just one tiny little slice of time. And I've already read you the end of the story. God wins. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, 1 through 5 this time. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, innocent, uh, incontinent, uh, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, heady, I don't know, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from uh, such turn away. Um, for this sort they are which creep into houses and lead captivity. Silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. This sounds like now. Um, and I know every generation has thought, man, this has to be the worst. But we could look back through history at what was happening 100 years ago, 
And while it was the same attacker behind it all, they've been emboldened. They're able to attack way more um, openly. They don't have to hide it at all. One thing I want to go back to, I missed it in my notes, but it is incredibly important. Now I haven't hit it yet. Sorry. Deuteronomy 22.5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination to the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 23, uh, 1. He that is wounded in the stones or hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Read up on that if you want. But it's a prominent issue in America today, both of those verses. Leviticus chapter 20. If a man also lie with, with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Romans one twenty seven. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient first Corinthians Know ye not that unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. This verse has a lot in it, and if you look in a concordance, it opens up a lot more. Effeminate. I thought I knew what that word meant, but I was like, seems kind of funny to me. I'm going to look it up. It comes from the Greek word malakos, no idea if I'm pronouncing that right, M-A-L-A-K-O-S, -M meaning soft, and then it says its common meaning was of a catamite, C-A-T-A-M-I-T-E. Has anyone ever heard of a catamite? Unless you've studied this stuff, I don't think you have. I never have until I went down this little rabbit hole. Catamite. A boy kept for a pederast. I didn't know what a pederast was, so I looked that up. A pederast is a man who engages in sexual activity with a boy or youth. Specifically, this verse is talking about being a pedophile. That is being fought for. People are on that side fighting for that right right now. They call it MAPS, Minor Attracted Person. Do you believe that? They've named it something to sound less bad. It's happening. It's in the news, if you look. Abusers of themselves with mankind. I followed that rabbit trail, and that's talking about homosexuality. You'd have to <clears throat> do some word studying there 
look it up in a concordance and see what the root word was. It takes a little while for me. It takes quite a bit of time. I'm not the best at researching this stuff. I sat there for a long time trying to get all this stuff right so that I could know what the verse meant. All I know is all these subjects are being fought for in America right now, and almost every single one of them have the word abomination somewhere in Scripture that describes them. Genesis 12, we're getting there. I hope that, I know that I'm a dry person. I know I'm not an exciting speaker, but I hope that these verses are something that you can put to good use and that this was not a waste of your time. I want you to be able to use these scriptures. Chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And I will make thee a great nation. He's talking to Abraham here. I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and thou, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. How could, how could that saying even be? From, from you, all families will be blessed. All right, he's the father of Israel. The only way that that statement can be true is if Jesus eventually comes out of that line, which we know he did because he was born of Jewish uh, descent. And if you look, there's other places in Scripture that talks about if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. We're in a dangerous spot today. If you look at Israel, they got guns pointed at them from all directions, and people in America are actively fighting, saying, we need to help the other side. I'm telling you right now, you never want to be in the other side of Israel. Israel is the side you want to be on, period. That is all through Scripture. I'm not going to say that every Israeli that is over there right now is perfect or right, because we can look through history and see God gave them so much and warned them, I gave you so much, don't forget where it came from, and yet they did over and over and over. They forgot why they were great, and then they got into the paganisms of their time. They were... One thing I didn't go into this was uh, talking about the babies. Moloch. Read about Moloch. Abortion is big right now because Moloch isn't around. Moloch was first. They didn't want their babies, so they would just say, let's, let's take them to the temple and donate them. They put them in this idol to be burned. God warned them not to do that. And here we are doing that, America. Genesis 21. And the Lord visited Sarah. As he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he spoken, as had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare children, or bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called his name, called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare him, Isaac. We know the Hebrews is through the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You need to be on the side of Israel. Zechariah, there's one we don't go to very much, but uh, every book of the Bible has important stuff in it. We're going to go to Zechariah for a second here. Tap chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 3. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all the people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered, gathered together against it, in that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Verse 9, and it shall come to pass in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I don't know when this is, but it's going to happen. I guarantee it. The Bible said it. I might not be perfect. I can't say that I live perfectly what the scripture wants me to. I fail. But I can tell you this. It's right, and I'm the one that's wrong. When the Bible says it's going to curse those that curse Israel, it's right. There, you don't even have to debate that with someone. Romans chapter 11.
verses 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What not ye, what ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, uh, Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Down in verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, fall salvation, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. We are so fortunate. We get to believe in God. We get to learn about him. The Jews handled what they were given so poorly. They had so many downfalls, captivities, and their cities destroyed. Just an open mockery to the world at times. But yet God always preserved some. And we're so fortunate that we get to see this and learn about it and have salvation Bless Israel or be cursed. God said it. By no means am I here to tell you that I have it all figured out. I'm not sinless. I'm here to tell each one of you that as sinners, we must be vigilant to avoid supporting the ideas this world pushes. Do not be confused. None of these ideas being fought for that God calls as an abomination are new ideas. This is stuff that was written in the scripture four or 5,000 years ago. This is not new. Read Genesis 19 on your own sometime for the full story of Sodom and Gomorrah and, his, and Lot and his daughters and their descendants. In the dispensation of grace, beginning at the day of Pentecost, and also you see Jesus forgiving people of sins that in the Old Testament times, which he was still a part of, would have been a punishment of stoning. We see he did not stone them. And said, he said, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. The punishments for some sins have changed. But the standard for what is sin has never changed. God doesn't change. We no longer see the stoning of people caught in adultery or homosexuality or other things. I see zero evidence, though, that the act itself has become any less wrong. Sin is sin. Your sins and the sin of others are all sins. One sin is all it takes to not be in good standing with God, our creator. The punishment for one single sin in a whole lifetime is death. One sin. If you only ever committed one sin, you are still not perfect, and you need salvation. That's Romans 6.23. The one and only step from being a sinner to being declared righteousness is through the perfect sacrifice God provided for us, Jesus Christ. That's Romans 3, 20-28. If you have any questions about any of this, I don't have a whole lot of information that I didn't already give you, but we could look at it together. Um, if you have any questions about salvation, if you have any questions about anything, um, you're welcome to hit me up. Um, I know there's others here. Phil would be happy to sit down with somebody. I don't know who else. Pastor Sal. There's plenty of people. If anyone has a question, it's a great time to reach out to me or someone else. And as long as whoever you're reaching out to reaches for a Bible first, then you're already in the right uh, place and you're getting the right help and the right answers. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here again. I thank you for your scripture, Lord. I thank you that I don't have to hold these, uh, make up these, these un, uh, unpopular positions on my own, Lord. You gave us what is right and wrong, and I can just look at it and read from your word what is right and what is wrong, and I can avoid what you've given us as wrong, and I can embrace what you've given us as right. I ask that you'd help me to further embrace what is right and further myself from the things that you've told us is an abomination, Lord. I ask you to be with each one of the people here, Lord, that 
have all these scriptures in their hands right now, Lord. I ask you'd help them to further study them and become more familiar with them and understand why things are wrong. Maybe they could also uh, understand more about why we're being attacked in the very specific ways we're being attacked, Lord. Help us to protect our children, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I appreciate that. I really appreciate that sermon, Jay. Because uh, the Bible tells us that Satan is the author of confusion, and we live in a world that right now is very, very confused. And uh, the temptation I find with me personally is uh, my main interaction with folks is on social media. I go on Facebook, and I will argue stuff based on facts that I find that I'm researching. And I think, I think we should be arguing these, uh, we should be arguing from a point of scripture. So this, uh, that list you gave us is gonna be very helpful. And I really appreciate that sermon. So if you would, a um, little side thought there. If you would stand with me, we're gonna open to hymn number three, uh, 332, Rock of Ages. Thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you for, for everything that you've given us. We thank you for this nation that you've given us and for our homes and our families and just how good you are to us every day. Lord, I, I pray that when we reach out to people that we're reaching out in love. And Lord, I pray that we're also reaching out, speaking truth. Um, uh, Lord, I, I pray that we are leaning on the scripture as we reach out in truth to folks and that we are the best ambassadors that we can be for you in this uh, very, very confused and deceived world. Uh, Lord, watch over us as we go out of here today uh, and bring us back again safely next time. And I thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.